So, if you're like me, you have a bunch of Amigas, and you like to keep them all pretty much up to date. In the past, it wasn't so much of an issue, because there just weren't that many releases, but now that Hyperion has taken on the mantle of Amiga OS development, we're getting frequent classic OS updates, and it's, and it's great. But, it comes with a problem. So, on classic Amigas, the operating system was distributed in two parts. There was what, what, what came on the disc, and then there's what came in the ROM, the Kickstart ROM. And it wasn't uncommon back in the day to update the Kickstart ROM on your Amiga. So, for example, this first chip here is a Kickstart 1.2 ROM that I pulled out of my Amiga 2000 back in the day and replaced with a Kickstart 1.3 ROM. This upgrading of ROMs, though, eventually becomes expensive. Resellers, you know, typically charge between $10 and $40 for the privilege of burning uh, new ROMs. And if you have a couple of Amigas and their releases every couple of years, that starts to add up quick. And it's also really wasteful because most of the ROMs that these resellers are using are reprogrammable and can be reused multiple times. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to use the ROM chips that you likely already have using things that you can buy now on Amazon for roughly $100 and be able to reuse and reprogram those ROM chips over and over again. First, you have to have the right kind of ROM chips. So there are typically two very common ROM chips for the Amiga. The first are ones that look like this. So I have an example here from Moss. And then I have a much later example here from a company called MX. These are mask ROMs. They are not reprogrammable. You cannot, you cannot reuse these. And these are typically found either as factory or Commodore originals, or very late you know, factory originals from the SCOM era, like, for example, this one from the Amiga 4000T. If you only have ROMs like this, you can't reuse them. If you have a ROM that has a sticker on it, it's very likely that you'll be able to reuse that ROM. So if you take off the sticker and the ROM looks like this, and has a similar part number, which is, focus please, AM27C400, there are other models from other manufacturers. This is a, a, an example from AMD. If you have ROM chips that look like this, with a little window, then these are EEPROMs, and they can be erased and reprogrammed. So this is what you want to look for. How do EEPROMs work? So this little window on the IC packet is key to the whole operation. We can see in here this gold bit here. This is where the data is actually written. And when this is exposed to UV light, which the window lets in, that UV light erases the data that's that's encoded on this surface. So what you would do is you would write the data to this chip, cover this window with a little sticker, and that sticker is enough to stop all UV light, and that means you have a stable ROM chip for as long as it doesn't get exposed to UV light. Then if you need to reuse this, you would remove the sticker, expose this surface to a large amount of UV light, reprogram it, and then place the sticker back on, or place another sticker. I'm not sure what the rewrite cycles are for these, but... Uh, you can look those up on the data sheet. For the use case that we're doing, which is occasional updates to the ROM, these should be able to be reused several times. And with this kit costing about $100, and with rewrite services on the low end being about, I don't know, $15, if you do this around eight or nine times, you're going to break even. And if you do this more than 10, then you're actually going to be saving a significant amount of money. And these chips are no longer being manufactured. This is a dwindling resource. So the more that you reuse these, the better off everyone will be. 
and you're also saving money, and you're also not having to worry about shipping time, and it's just kind of fun to do yourself. If you have these chips, let's go on to the next section and we can talk about the actual mechanics of the process. Today, I'm going to be working on the Amiga 4000 again. Um, I've moved this out of the lab and into the living room because it's cooler and quieter in here. And I've got a, uh, a ROM programmer here. Now this is from a company called Xgeku or Xgeku. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this. But this replaces um, the old TL866A programmers that were talked about a lot. This is the new iteration of it. And I should be able to put Amiga ROMs in here without an adapter. And I also have a, a UV light eraser to erase the ROMs. Now the downside with this new unit is the Linux support is not there yet, so I'm going to have to do this on Windows, unfortunately. Um, but the goal is, you know, at the end of the day to have the latest 3.2 ROMs in here. To get to the ROMs, I had to remove the, the drive assembly and also the CPU board. But there we are. Those are the two, those are the two ROMs. Now, if I remember correctly, the Amiga 4000 originally shipped with 3.0 ROMs. I happen to have 3.1 ROMs that I suspect were upgraded by Software Hut um, before I bought this machine. So they, they say Amiga Technologies on them, and the, the labels are kind of peeling off because I have this uh, supersonically washed, this, this board. Um, but these are... Um, these are erasable ROMs, so we rip off the labels, put them in the, the UV the UV machine, and after 10 to 15 minutes, they should be ready to be written to again. Alright, so I got the ROMs out and removed the labels and um, you know cleaned up a little bit of the schmutz with an alcohol wipe. These are both the same type of chip. On the 32-bit Amigas, which is basically any Amiga that didn't by default have a 6800 processor, so 4000, 3000, 1200. There are two chips that comprise the Kickstart ROM. There's a high chip and a low chip. They're both the same model of, of ROM chip, so like it doesn't matter. I don't have to keep these straight while I'm cleaning and, um, and erasing them. But when I program them, I do have to know which one's the high ROM and which one is the low ROM. So now that these are clean, they go into this UV light eraser, which this has a little drawer that the ROM chips go into. And then if I, when I turn this on, You can kind of see there, you can see the UV light poking through there. And that UV light, when it goes through these windows, it basically erases the contents of the ROM. And I could just leave these out in the sunlight for a while and that would do the trick. But this, this will wipe them out in 15 minutes. In the drawer, close the drawer, turn on, wait 15 minutes. All right, it's been 15 minutes, so these ROMs are probably suitably cooked. Turn this off. Pull them out of here. They're not hot, so, you know, ready to use. So this ROM programmer is new to me, too. Bought this, brand new. Um, and pretty simplistic packaging. Had a few worthless information cards. The programmer itself, a USB cable and a um, a good luck bag or something not quite familiar what this uh, what this is but it says good luck on it I think and I'm you know always good to have good luck when you're programming ROMs so we have our first failure here so even though this chip programmer has the right number of pins for these type of ROMs it apparently still requires an adapter. So, that's on order. And, 
the website made it seem like it didn't require one, but apparently, according to the program itself, uh, it does. <laughs> uh, so this is on order, um, and once this comes in, we'll try again. So, just this unit alone was not able to program my ROM for my Amiga. And uh, this is frustrating because on the website for this unit, it really didn't indicate that you need an adapter. But um, in the software that uh, uh, XGeku provides, they, they've got pictures of how to put in the, the each ROM type, and it's very clear that you need an adapter. So this just came... This is uh, ADP D42EXA, uh, and this is the adapter. I purchased them dire purchased this directly from them. Although they have plans if uh, available on the internet if you want to make one of these yourselves. Anyhow, pretty straightforward. You know, this goes in the dip socket on the programmer, and then you hook up the uh, the ribbon cable, and then. The ROM goes in, in here. Now one other trick that I had to figure out was these, um, these ROMs are AM AM27C400, which is the one used in most Amigas. However, the A1200 and some other models um, can use um, AM27C800s, which are which are the same as this chip, um, but they're bit they they have larger capacity and they're 42 pin instead of 40 pin. Um, so because of that, that this is a a 400 and not an 800, I had to put this in offset one pin. So instead of having it uh, snug against the top here where pin one should be I had to put it one row down so if you have um, 27C 800s which are again larger capacity and two more pins then you would put them in starting at uh, at the one but those are kind of rare um, and again not all Amiga models support it and it's not the size that that Hyperion is making their ROM so that would have to be you know in order to need a bigger ROM like that you would have to customize the kernel but uh, but that's it once this is in and plugged into here the software is relatively straightforward to use so we've got our ROM in ready to program and two things to note first is that there is a little notch on the ROM that's not present on the other side. It's a little indentation that indicates the, the direction. So you don't want to put it in backwards. Uh, and they, on this unit, the, the little notch should be towards the LEDs. The other thing, like I mentioned before, is that because this is an AM27C400, i.e. the smaller ROM and not the bigger uh, AM27C800 that you can use on the Amiga 1200 this is offset by one pin so rather than having it flush up against the edge here there is one pin space so let's switch over to the program view and we'll give a little demo on how to use the programs that come with this so this is XG Pro this is the software that XGeku provides you can download it from their website they don't provide a physical media when they ship out the ROM programmer, so you have to get it from there. There's also an open source project to provide an interface for this for Linux, but as of time of recording, there's not support for, for this particular model in that, so we have to use the Windows version. So before we start programming the ROM, we want to select the right ROM from the from the list so I have AM 27 C 400 dip 40 that's that's what these ROM chips are um, look at the model number on the ROM there were several manufacturers although AMD seems to be one of the most common 
and dip 40 is the package once you select that and if you have to select a different one you know this this program is very helpful in that it shows you kind of how to connect these up so once you have that selected then first thing I want to do is to run the blank operation here and what this will do is uh, this will ensure that the ROM is in fact blank and want to see this right here devices blank so that means that we had it cooking in the UV light long enough there's no data it's totally erased next I want to load up a ROM file and Hyperion distributes two types of files. They distribute a .rom and .bins. So for this program, you want a .bin file. The .roms are for emulators. So we're open up one of these .bins. Now I've already programmed the ROMs for my Amiga 4000 as a test run. So let's program a uh, Amiga. 2000 ROM here. So this is one of the 16-bit ROMs for one of the machines that has a 6800. If we open this up, it'll show the data of the ROM here. And in this program for these 16-bit ROMs, we can actually read some text here. Amiga ROM, operating system and libraries, all of that. So that that's what's to expect. If we load in, say, a 32-bit ROM, which would do that right now, or load in, say, the Amiga 4000T High ROM, we won't be able to see text. And this is because these AM27C400 chips are 16-bit chips, and so the way that those 32-bit Amigas get a 32-bit ROM image is they interleave the data between the two chips. So we won't be able to see any, any legible text uh, with the 32-bit ROM. All right, so let's go back to our 16-bit ROM here. So we've got this loaded up, and now all we need to do is hit Program. Dialog box will come up. We hit Program, and it'll go on its merry way. So now our ROM is programmed didn't take very long at all a uh, little over a minute and also as part of this it programs it and then it verifies it so we are we're now good to go we can eject this ROM from the programmer and slap a sticker on the window to protect it from UV light and use it in our Amiga now this uh, if we wanted to do independent verification let's say that we had an Amiga that was misbehaving and we wanted to check the ROM. There is an independent verify option here and you just load up the the .bin file you want to compare the ROM contents to which I've, I've already done. It's already loaded in and we hit verify here and it'll verify the ROM. Now if you get errors with this you know make sure that everything's set up right refer to the pictures and the, the videos that I have to see how it needs to look. But also I've noticed that sometimes this check ID is enabled. And for the specific ROMs that I have, this causes an error. So you see check ID error. And I don't know what this actually is, but I found that unticking this check ID and running these through seems to work fine. So that was for a 16-bit ROM. Now if you're doing a 32-bit ROM you have to do this twice, right? You have to burn uh, both the high and the low ROMs to different chips, but the procedure is is the same. Load up the bin file, program it, Take the ROM out, load up the next bin file, program it, and there you go. Relatively straightforward. All right, new ROMs have been programmed and inserted in. 
I like to label these with both the low and high designation as well as the uh, the ch the um, the component number to make it easier to match it up on the board. So on the Amiga 4000, uh, the low is in U176 and the high is in U175. It does not say low and high on the main board, even though that's how um, ROMs are usually distributed. So a small note here. Be very careful about the direction that you insert in these ROM chips. As I mentioned before, there's a little notch that indicates uh, where the direction of the ROM should face. That notch indicates pin 1. The Amiga 4000 is nice because it has a little outline silk screened on the motherboard that kind of represents which direction you should put the ROM. But uh, other Amigas may not have this. So, so do be very careful because if you insert these in backwards, um, then you could potentially damage your Amiga. So be, be very careful. All right. So we have success. And these uh, new Kickstart 322 ROMs come up immediately even with the floppy drive and the IDE card removed so that's a that's a good improvement that they've added in maybe some smarts to those to those timeouts um, so anyhow thanks for watching hope this was useful and happy burning